I've never worn one of these rock star things before. It's good. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I guess I should clarify a little where I am in the world. I learned about two weeks ago from somebody what my current position is. I was laid off by AT&T Labs about two years ago and found I had enough money in the bank that I didn't have to rush off to work. So uh, apparently my position now is I'm on the mountain. This is a Silicon Valley concept where you're working in a business, you make billions of dollars or not, and then you say, I've had enough of this, and you go up on the mountain and you sit there and you think about life, and sometimes people come up and say, oh, guru, would you like to do this project? No, no, no. Would you like, maybe, you know, you should do this. I'm on the mountain right now. I'm going to change what my, my description in Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn to be on the mountain. Uh, because I don't have to work. Oddly enough, I still work a lot. In fact, I don't understand where I ever had time to spend 40 hours a week going to some job. I'm uh, working on apps and stuff, and in fact, the talk I'll be giving later today talks about passwords. It's an old talk which has been warmed up quite a bit and involves a new app I just wrote, just got into the App Store a couple days ago. Uh, that's an experiment you might want to try. And that was something I thought of in my basement. But I realized that I can program in my basement and I don't get any input. I love coming to conferences because people say, tell us about this. And I say, I have no idea. You tell me. And I learn stuff. And it's great. So thank you for inviting me. I love coming to conferences like this. In fact, the Netherlands is probably the single country I've been invited to the most. And I thank you all for that. Um, I love coming here. It's a great trip, a great visit. And of course, the Netherlands has been a big player in the internet over the years, including the early internet. Some some older people actually know what MCVAX is. Yeah, you know, it goes back a ways. Um, so it's always fun to come back here. So I'm on the mountain at home. In fact, we just bought a Tesla. So we're doing okay. So I, I think I, I will be uh, perhaps experimenting with a Tesla, and I don't mean by driving. Uh, <laughs> But I'm a little worried about voiding the warranty. You know, it has an Ethernet port on it. <laughs> so you have to change the wires around. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, so you can't just plug it in. So I'm really kind of interested in watching the network. Also, it updates itself over either the, the 3G network that it comes with or through your Wi-Fi. Well, I'm going to let it use my Wi-Fi. <laughs> and I'm going to watch and see what they say and what they do. Of course, Tesla is actually, I understand, is actually looking for security people. So I suppose I could come off the mountain and work for them. And, and anyway, um, while sitting at home, I, I've, looked, I've been sitting around thinking, what sort of talk should I give? And as my last boss once told me, you know, you're not a kid anymore. Um, which is, you know, you're not so young yet. And I thought, well, <laughs> it is true that kids these days do seem to be very young and, and barely remember the 1990s, much less some time when people did work back early on. And I wondered, is there something I can look, a talk I can give over the longer period of time that might give uh, some feedback into what's going on? Let's see, how am I doing? I didn't start my clock, did I? Okay, so... Um, so let's give it a try. I've, I've been thinking about security since the Nixon administration. And I'm going to be using US presidential time to give sort of a broad measure of time instead of trying to remember particular dates. And I'm starting to get a long view of things. And so I thought I'd put together a talk about how I actually, well, if you've been a security person for decades, you basically think several things. One, it's the same old stuff going on, the same old bugs the same old problems, and it's never going to get better. Um, and I actually think it is going to get better, and I'm going to try to convince you. This talk, I designed this talk for people who worked in the government for five decades and said it's never going to get better, and I'm saying here, I think it will, and here's why. And when I'm done, I look forward to some of you perhaps telling me why I'm wrong. Um, this is not a grant proposal. I, I'm going to be making some technical suggestions. That doesn't mean I'm an expert in CPU design or software design, but just some observations on how we might be able to do this. I do have some references. They're on the slides. And these the exact slides I'm using right now, which changed about 10 minutes ago, will be on my web page before the end of the day. So you can download the PDF of them if you wish. Um, so what is the current state of affairs in computing? It's great. Okay, how many people here do banking online? 
That is pretty much everybody. I guess it must be safe, huh? <laughs> it's safe enough. You have to. Um, how about retirement accounts? That nest egg that I'm relying on to buy my Tesla. How many people do that online? <laughs> You're not saving money is the problem, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> shopping and commerce. This, this is not a failure. <laughs> this is working. Okay, there are some problems. But really, the world is a lot better than it was 30 years ago in many senses. I love living in the future. You know, I grew up, I, I was in grade school when Sputnik went up and the U.S. said, oh, science, we've got to do stuff. And I got caught up in it and became a science guy And when I was about eight. And I've been a science guy ever since. I have talked to Nobel Prize winners. And age eight seems to be about the time they start getting excited, plus or minus a little bit in science. Some of them, well, since I was three, but uh, <laughs> that seems to be the right age. And uh, so for me, uh, that was sort of the end of the golden age of science fiction. The future had flying cars and jet packs and food pills and stuff. Well, we don't have those, but we have lasers and... Uh, 12-hour nasal spray and, and vaccines. And f as far as I'm concerned, this is the future right now. I'm in the future, and I love being in it. I have an electric car. Holy smokes. And, and what's more, the electric car doesn't suck. <laughs> it has a huge amount of power. It's too expensive. Okay, but we're in the future. You know, you, you early adopters have to pay more. But it is wonderful. So here's some other measures. Here is, for example, Apple stock. That's not a failure. Uh, this is a semi-log graph, by the way. Similarly, here's uh, Amazon. Now, the, these charts are perhaps a few months old, and they are still bumpy, but they still look pretty much like this. By the way, for those of you who aren't saving enough, these aren't bad suggestions. Uh, and here's Google, an advertising company. Um, doesn't look like a failure to me. So what is the current state of affairs on the internet? It's lousy. We have spies in our business. There's a huge advantage for the attackers. How do you keep them out? I know most of you do this battle. We have crappy client operating systems that people can break into with all sorts of different ways. Leaky sandboxes. I thought we'd solve that problem 40 years ago with operating systems. Um, people who want crazy, dangerous features get them in there like boats with optional holes in the bottom. Uh, and, and then there's the visit to grandma's house. Okay, you go and you visit grandma. And it's, you know, she lives a little distance away, and you sit down and you talk about the kids and the job. And after an hour or so, she says, oh, by the way, I'm having a little trouble with my computer. Can you help? Does this sound familiar to you? And then you go and you spend the next four hours cleaning the viruses off that you cleaned off the last time you visited grandma. Wouldn't it be nice to give her an operating system where you could have those four hours back and talk about the kids and her rheumatism some more? So this is broken too. And one of my goals is to make a computer where you don't have that for grandma. And it turns out that the solution for grandma is probably the same as the solution that most generals want and probably that most corporate employees want. It's not for everyone. I mean, gamers wouldn't want this. You as actual com hackers of computing and so on probably want something that's a little more dangerous and a little more useful. But grandma doesn't need it. She's only running four apps. And even if she's watching, stealing and watching movies, that isn't a big application load. That's not hard to do either in software or with CPU power these days. So what isn't working? <laughs> well, as Bob Morris said, security people are paid to think bad thoughts. We walk around in the, with dark thoughts. There's a bridge. I wonder how I would blow it up. Uh, how would I stop someone from blowing it up? Do this all the time, especially with software. Um, so we live in a dark world. A lot, when we bring up these things, excuse me, it looks to me it, like if you run this, someone might be able to come in through this way and break your system. Uh, you're just an academic. Uh, that's not going to happen. We don't have time to worry about that right now. It's never going to happen. They're not going to attack us. 
And so I'm going to give you a couple examples of stuff I've looked at over the last 30 years that I said, it doesn't look right to me, but it's probably okay. One of the first talks I gave in the Netherlands, doubtless, I'd, I'd have to go back, was about passwords. And in fact, later today, I'll be talking about passwords. And of course, passwords are broken. And we've known this since the late, since the Jimmy Carter administration. Um, but uh, by the early Bush 41 administration, there, there were devices that you could have. And I'd give talks saying how bad passwords are, and you really should use these devices. And there are two of them here. There's a secure net key, which none of you have ever heard of. Well, maybe a couple have. And that one has a DES key in it that your server has. So the two of them share a secret, and it's challenge response. And this is a lovely device. Uh, has a, a lot of good cryptological properties. Um, I liked it a lot, and I thought it was the best solution. And then there was this other one, these guys that were clock-based. Now, the clock-based, this is still so much better than passwords. I was saying in these talks, the, the secure net key is an epsilon better than the, the, than the secure ID, okay? It's a little bit better, but they're both so much better than passwords. Go ahead and use one. And I've been saying this since about 1990. Well, as you all know, because you, you, you lived through it in the last, about three years ago, we learned that Epsilon has a large value. <laughs> and this was not a surprise. There was a master secret kept back at corporate headquarters. And even though RSA, who is a fine company, certainly security conscious, was defending its master keys, they got out. And I don't know about the rest of the world, but there were parts of the U.S. government and their contractors who had a very busy six months cleaning up after this. You know, all because of this little hole. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah see, I told them so. Now, uh, you could also argue, is, is RSA broken? Well, they use these things for 20 years without any appearance of this problem. So maybe that's a success. You know, you write a program and it works for 20 years. You make a lot of money on it. And then you have a little startup problem with it 20 years later. I don't know. Um, the business model was successful. So an another thing I keep hearing is the best is the enemy of the good. The we hear this all the time. It's, oh, yes, the best is the enemy of the good. We'll do good enough. I think this is giving good way too much of a good name. We're, it, don't flatter yourself. The good solution isn't that good. Um, in in uh, Tracy Kidder's book, The Soul of a New Machine, which is now, I guess, 25 years old, uh, I was reading through it, and I got to some comment on the wall. I had used data general products. That's what the book was about, and I didn't like them. They had a sort of something that tasted kind of like Unix, but it wasn't, and they had fixed it. And I got to a page where it said, on his wall, it said, not all jobs are worth doing right. Now, my father told me, taught me a lot, a job worth doing is worth doing right. And here's this guy saying, well, not all of them. But at that point, I said, this is why Data General's systems were crap. And I stopped reading the book. <laughs> um, another thing that we have is the cool, it works, let's, let's use it. And this happens in all the industries. It happens in airplanes. Wow, we can fly. <laughs> we'll fly around. We'll make them safe later. Cars, yes, I'm going to get back to that. In the Internet, back in the early 80s, there were, well, actually, a lot of these are newer than the early 80s, but NFS, SMB, TFTP, Finger, SendMail, and our login. These were all services that came out. As soon as computers could connect, cool, we can log into them. We'll use our login for security so that you know you're coming from the right IP address and so on. And, and it worked. It was great. And we'll get to security later. If you look at the original Ethernet papers, they say security is not a problem of Ethernet. It's handled by the upper layers. We'll get to that later. <laughs> This is largely true of first-generation nuclear reactors. Unfortunately, a lot of us are still running first-generation nuclear reactors. We're a lot better at it now. Unfortunately, we're still using the old ones. Um, so this, this is a, a force that has been in here. A lot of this, we haven't gotten to fixing it yet. Here are some other ideas that have seemed bad to me over the years. Shared libraries. 
Now, you guys use this all the time. You've probably sat, I know you've sat. In April, you, you got the, uh, the, the stupid bug that came out, the heart bleed, and you spent a day looking, maybe more, looking at live tools going across your screen as you're updating your system. I know I had a sudden emergency week where I had to redo all my stuff, and I just run eight or nine machines for myself. And all of a sudden, I had to rebuild everything and move them up and so on. And I'm watching live tool going by, thinking, once again, why do we still have shared libraries? Shared libraries were introduced in the mid 80s when the X window system appeared. It was so huge and memory was so small that they said, we need to take all these routines that get repeated over and over and over again with all these other X things and put them in a shared library so we won't have to load them in because memory is expensive and we need this. We're still using shared libraries and my, my problem is if I compile a program and it calls in shared libraries, I never know what I'm running. Static libraries, it brings in the libraries that I have right now, and I've got a binary I can check some, and a binary that, assuming the operating system doesn't change, and that should be a fairly stable assumption, this program is the same all the time. And so why do I have shared libraries in there? In fact, a lot of programs you can't compile static because the developers didn't really check it well enough to make sure it all works. Or there's some other part of the operating system that didn't bother building a static version of whatever they've got. Uh, these seem like a bad idea. And of course, if, if I said, well, I said to myself, well, SSHD has been working pretty well for about a decade, right? And I went and said, oh no, there was a bug back in 2011, something like that, where you could break into it. And why? Because there was an attack on a shared library. It wasn't SSHD's fault, exactly. Um, and of course, they make. I, I'm still an old-fashioned guy. I still use ch root, which they call the old man's virtual machine. Um, I, I think that's a bit unfair. It's still a nice tool, and we have some nice new ones coming. Um, you can change a program after it's installed. Uh, okay, I said that. So I say the shared libraries, and frankly, dynamic libraries, .dll, .dlls are a bad idea. I want them compiled into a program. It makes everything simpler. The kernel gets simpler, and this is one of my themes today. Um, and there have been a long history of shared library attacks. And I talked, they're not worth it. Okay, moving along here. You can see that we have about 106 slides. I usually do about two minutes per slide, uh, two slides per minute, sorry. That's an important difference. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> checklists and audits. I know how we'll make this machine secure. We will give you a checklist and you will go down through it. You know, eight character passwords, check. Uh, backups every week, check, and so on. Uh, these don't work as well as you'd like. You, you'd sort of hope, I mean, they're a fine source of ideas. But for example, if you handle credit card information, the credit card companies, at least in the States, have something called PCI audits, which they'll come in and make sure you're handling the credit card information properly. And I consulted for one company a number of years ago that had a PCI audit, and then three days later after passing it, they discovered a VPN that had been exporting credit card information for two and a half years. Okay, you've heard of this break-in, I'm not gonna mention the company, but the PCI audit didn't catch this outflow of encrypted data that was going out into the world someplace. Um, and this is an, often an, an issue. You know, if some congressman or some government official comes up to you and says, how do we fix this? And I've had senators ask me this question. I said, well, checklists is not the answer. And in fact, the law in general, you can do it two ways. You can say, well, the law says that to protect health information, you need at least a nine character password. That's a stupid law. On the other hand, if you have one more general as the US HIPAA health protection law has, which says you'll protect data at rest. Well, okay, that sounds good. But if you're the actual guy who has to do this, what does it mean? What, what do you deploy? How do you put this in there? And the usual answer is you go to a conference like this and say, Psst, how do you guys protect this information? Because if you do it the same as the other guys, you can look the judge in the eye when it all leaves and say, we are using industry standards here. You know, it's not perfect. Everybody knows it's not perfect. Um, at least that gets you out of the liability business. But it really doesn't solve the problem, does it? Here's another thing that doesn't work, and I come to conferences like this and hear security people saying, we've got to teach the users. It's about user education. No, it isn't. <laughs> it isn't the user's fault. 
Angela Sass, thank you. Uh, they can't understand the complexities of what's going on. And the computer, the computer is asking questions. Do you want me to reload the DLL? Yes or no? <laughs> uh, I often don't know the answer to these questions, and I, I'm supposed to. <laughs> um, and if you don't know what you're doing, you, you know, all you have to do is be a little tired. I came home one day from work. It was 8 o'clock at night. Got an email, dear Amazon seller, you know, we need to check, you know, click here. And I clicked, and I got through typing about half my password when I said, oh, God, no. <laughs> First of all, I'm not an Amazon seller, I'm a buyer, and I bought a bunch of stuff that day. Secondly, I just clicked on a link in an email, and I was busy feeding it my information. Now, fortunately, I have the skills to go look at the web page. I saw the JavaScript. I saw that it hadn't harvested my password yet. Um, but I was grandma. Uh, this, this, <laughs> I was tired. And, um, and I changed my password anyway, just in case I missed something, because it was late at night. Dave Prezado used to say he never changed the mail system after 8 PM, because usually you, there's a good chance that you do more damage than you do good. So what else is not working? Strong passwords, and I'll talk about this in my other talk today. We're telling people, pick a password you can't remember and then don't write it down. <laughs> and then, oh, by the way, do this a different way for every system you talk to, the important ones especially. So this is poor engineering. That's you and me, folks. We're getting this wrong, and I think we can do better. And of course, we've had massive data spills. This shows bad things. Target, T, TJX, of course. Target, ro passwords. Thank you, all of the people out there who have been leaking passwords. It gives us password researchers huge databases to run experiments on. Uh, <laughs> and I mean huge. And we trade them with ourselves. Um, another thing that's not working is PKI. And you'd sort of hope it would, right? You start with a trusted root. And it grants things to various companies. And if the root says that my bank has this certificate, that sounds like a pretty good way to go. Um, but of course, there's so many of these. There's so many CAs out there. We've seen attacks. Stuxnet used this. Um, so I said, OK, I'm going to put Cert Patrol in Firefox. I'm going to watch the CAs that come in. And I'm going to keep track of them until I can make a list over a year of the seven I really trust. OK, and the rest we won't do. And I got such a load of crap every time I loaded something. New certificates from Google, new certificates just all over the place. After a year, there were a sea of certificates. And I couldn't, I couldn't keep track. I just deleted Cert Patrol. It's broken. Maybe what I want to do is start my own list of trusted CAs. Here are the CAs Ches trust. I mean, I was thinking of that. You know, we'll have a few security guys say, here are the eight you want to have. The problem is it isn't eight, it's 200. OK, well, so what are some other problems? SMM, system maintenance mode. This is a mode in Intel chips. It's a back door. It is an optional hole in the bottom of the boat. It is a way that they can do stuff like load microcode and so on into the CPU. This sounds dicey to me. Why is there this magic secret mode that's in there? It's been there since the Intel 386. Sounds bad to me. I, it, and of course, you're not supposed to be able to get it from the kernel or user mode, but I've seen some papers that say if you set this bit and do this with this I.O. address, you get into system maintenance mode. And of course, all the memory models change and so on, and you can do stuff. It has always worried me. Um, and then you go look at the Snowden attacks. You know, you don't need to know the details. You just go through top secret, top secret, top secret. And how to attack this machine? Go into system maintenance mode and then do this. Next one, go into system maintenance mode and then do this. Ha! I think one of the scariest parts about the secrets that have been released is that at least the ones I've seen have not surprised me. OK, it's sort of, yeah, I was worried about that one. OK, there's something there which means if I was running one of these spy things, I would have been doing the right thing, chasing them down. Um, Pentium complexity, the ring, rings three and zero, system manage mode. Virtual machine interface. Um, virtual machines seem like a good security solution, uh, but we're not quite doing it right. First of all, it's an odd place. You know, security is about drawing lines, safe, unsafe. And you draw these walls around, and you have a bunch of them. Back in the old days, the line between the kernel and the hardware 
was not a security boundary. It was a place where the kernel guys walked down the hall to the hardware guys and said, what does this register do in this disk controller? How do I talk to this thing? They talked a lot, and the knowledge of the hardware guys was encoded by the kernel guys into the kernel, and this was a tight connection of extremely privileged stuff. You know, go to this track, read this sector, that sort of stuff. And suddenly we've split them off there, drawn a line and said, bad guys, good guys? Um, now, it's turned out pretty well. I mean, virtual machines, you know, it was okay for IBM in the 60s, and they actually got B1 security on one of their machines. Um, but that interface is an odd place to do it. And of course, our trusted domain, the DOM0 for a lot of these, is a huge, giant hunk of Linux. Bad, it, it's too good. That, now, there are VMs that are, are much smaller, and that's better. Microcode, we have microcode in Intel and AMD chips. Who? installs that microcode. I don't usually get an update that says your CPU microcode needs to be fixed. Press here. No, this happens down in the BIOS sometimes. And I recently, one of the conferences I've been at in the last few weeks, I had lead developers from both Intel and AMD. And I took them aside and said, you know, this microcode, in fact, the whole circuit thing worries me. How well does Intel protect these circuit things, How, if I were a bad guy and went in and wanted to change something, like turn off memory management protection, could I do it? And they said, we, we protect our stuff really well, but yes, you could. <laughs> and they, AMD has said that too. I mean, guys, now, the comp these are not official company announcements. Um, but if you're worried about supply chain, someplace in the wiring list of the Intel Pentium is an important place to consider because uh, you can do pretty nasty stuff. And how bad can a compromised CPU be? Well, there's, there's some lovely uh, papers out there. I have one here. Uh, uh, oh, that, that's a CPU management mode is one. There was another one by Sam King a few years ago from Illinois where they said, how many transistors do we have to change to make a Spark 7 dangerous? They had some things, worrying stuff here. Um, and of course, even if virtual machines work, there are papers out there that show that you can steal keys by examining the cache you share with the CPU next door to you. So that worries me. All of this, of course, the subtext is, is cloud computing a good idea? Um, I think it's a great idea if what you want to do is transcode movies, as Netflix does. I wouldn't put any secrets out there, certainly not in someone else's cloud. OK, I talked about this. OK, how about measuring security? Lord Kelvin said, if you can't measure something and put a number on it, you, it's pretty unsatisfactory. You really can't do science with it. <clears throat> and of course, there's this ongoing mild debate about whether computer science is a science. I submit it is not. There's very little science in computers, except when you're chasing a bug down, you're doing science, right? You're, you're testing hypotheses and running tests and doing that sort of stuff. Though that's not exactly science, it's engineering. So measuring computer security. We've been trying to do it for a long time. I had a general in 1999 say, son, I would like to uh, measure the security in my network. Give me a number so that you know this year we can say it's a 47 and next year it's a 63. And I can go to my funding agency and say, we're getting closer. And there have been people who have tried to do this with surface areas, attack surfaces, and so on. There, there was a company that, that tried to do this. And when you look deep down in here, there's always step 23 is some human saying, mm, that's about a three. Okay, that's not science. It may actually give you a fair idea of how secure it is, but it's, it's not science. And what would the answer look like? Is the surface area something measured in square Shannons? Uh, is it a graph theory thing, an Erdos paper? I don't know. And where do you measure? Because security is all about layers. These are the layers that are used to protect the acquisition and use of an American atomic bomb. They're sort of in broad strokes. If, if you have need to know and uh, enough clearance, you can go take a week long course down in Sandia Labs and they'll teach you all about hydrogen bombs and their effects. And Steve Bellavin put in a Freedom of Information Act request for the slides for that talk. <laughs> about half the slides came back blank. Um, but you know, when you talk to spooks, don't try to get their secrets because they're smarter than that, but do get their lessons because they'll teach you a lot of stuff. And this is just showing lots of layers, which anyone who's looked at a castle can understand. So I love living in the future. See, we went around this. Um, Velcro, I'd forgotten routine rockets to low Earth orbit computers that, you know, <laughs> this computer 
was completely unanticipated back in 1959. Science fiction writers did not write about these. I don't know of a single one that did this, much less that they were networked. Uh, you know, the best you'd have is a bigger, bigger computer in a giant building someplace that's thinking about the universe in uh, Asimov's wonderful uh, story, The Last Question. Uh, it wasn't a little tiny laptop trying to figure out whether entropy can be reversed. Um, there's been a lot of good security work that's been done. Uh, and I think we can win. I think we can build an affordable computing platform that can't be compromised by a user error not involving a screwdriver. Okay, that doesn't mean winning means there are no security problems. Right? They, there's still, people are still going to be fooled. You can still do it with supply chains. If someone can touch your computer, you're, you've lost. But it's our hardware, it's our software, it's our network. We ought to be able to win this. Um, I'm sick and tired of a lot of stuff that goes on here. APT, advanced persistent threats. They're not advanced. They shouldn't be. They're, they're persistent, all right. Um, but really, I haven't seen much new in the APTs. They're just a little better organized. Most of them are the same weaknesses we've seen for a long time. And doggone it, I'm becoming an old timer. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so the long view, which is what I'm getting up here on the mountain, is that we're still really early in the computer revolution. And this is why I think we're going to be okay. Because it's very early. We look at Moore's law and say, holy smokes, the CPU has doubled in speed every 18 months. And boy, are we making progress. But you know, we're not so much making progress. Um, uh, user interfaces, 10 years ago, the most prominent user interface was the Windows drop-down menu, which is awful. I mean, it's fine for getting some done, but not fast. As you know, preaching to the converted, command line lets you get to do most things much faster. That isn't everything. I'm moving files around. There are things that other paradigms work for, but we're still sort of hanging around with the user interface. And if you don't get the user interface right, all the rest of this stuff isn't going to work. So now I'm going to give you we're going to go to the car metaphor. Computers should be like cars, right? Well, um, I never liked this. I said, come on, cars are easy to handle. Computers are complicated. It's not the same. This metaphor is broken. And sitting up on the mountain, I've decided I was wrong. The car metaphor is actually quite apt because it's a high technology solution for the general public. And we are very early in it. We're not comparing apples to oranges. We're comparing grapes to raisins. And let, let's look at the Model T, which was a very popular car in the United States. Uh, back in 1913, you could get a Model T. It had 20 horsepower. Uh, it ran on gasoline, kerosene, and ethanol, any one of those. It had rear-wheel drive. Had two speeds plus reverse. That's nice. And forget this, available only in black. That's wrong. You couldn't get black. You could get gray, green, blue, and red. The model shown was $550, which was about four months' salary for someone working in the car factory. This was a new deal. This was a big deal. And it had electric start. Now, let me explain to you about the electric start, because um, you'd be surprised. The 1912 version had a crank, which you start. And you've seen this in the movies. Now, what I just did is the wrong way to crank. You crank it like this. That's right, you had to crank it with your left hand because if you cranked it with your right hand and it backfired, it would, the crank would come around and break your arm. Okay, so always crank your car with your left hand. How is that different from don't click on attachments in your email? <laughs> okay, you don't have to go to the hospital, but you can spend as much time fixing the problem. Clearly, we were at the place where it worked. I have to crank it, but I got a car. And it got better. And let's take another look. Here is, are the three pedals on the floor. Most of you will have no idea how to drive this vehicle. The pedal on the left shifted between the two forward gears. The pedal in the middle is the reverse gear. And the pedal on the right is the brake. OK? So hit the start button, go up, and go over. You, if you want to change the speed of the car, well, you could advance the spark or change the amount of power going into it by controls on the steering wheel. Yes, you sped up going like this. And of course, you had to worry about advancing the spark and doing the choke, which was something else you needed to do when start. So here are, especially for those younger of you, some old time auto words that we used to have to know that you don't care about. These, 
things like the choke, flood the engine. What does that mean? All the old timers here know what flooding the engine means. Friction point. Do you know that there are so few Americans driving stick shifts now that when someone goes to carjack a car and it's got a stick in it, they can't? <laughs> Now, I happen to love stick shifts, but it's getting harder and harder to get a car, buy a car in the U.S. that actually has a stick, even if you like it. When we got our Honda Accord in 2008, um, we picked a color and they said, I'm sorry, we're just not making sticks in that color. You're going to have to have this other color. About one car in 50 comes with a manual transmission now. And my kids who know how to drive a stick are the envy of their friends who don't know how to drive a stick. Okay, so vapor lock and double clutch. That's an old time thing. My mother had a car that didn't have a fuel pump. That meant when she went up a steep hill in the Adirondack Mountains, they had to back the car up so the gasoline could get into the engine. That was the 1930s, folks. And of course, the first seat belts, the two-point safety systems, were mandated in the early 60s. That's 50 years after cars really came to the US. Okay, this was a long time between it works and it's safer. And frankly, there, there's even more. I remember as a kid, every time there was a holiday weekend, at the end of the weekend, there'd be a news report that said 423 people died on the highway this holiday weekend. And the reason was because it was drunk driving. And sometime around the mid-1970s, the drunk driving crackdown came down so hard that there was no longer a bump on drunk driving weekends, and they stopped announcing those. But that's 60 years after this car. I submit to you, we're still at the Model T level of computing. And we're going to get a lot better, and we're not going to put up with don't click on attachments someday. You know, you don't have to be a mechanic to drive your car, and you shouldn't have to be a programmer or a security expert to use your computer safely, and that is my goal. It's not the driver's fault if the car catches, if, catches fire, if the engine catches fire. And we don't accept most company claims that it is, if the, if, if, that it's the driver's fault. Now, of course, new cars now have data buses in them, and they ha now should have two firewalls and only have one, uh, <laughs> because you can put in an MP3 and take over a car. You can even broadcast it over Bluetooth. There's a whole bunch of stuff. It's like the auto guys never paid any attention to anything we said over the last 30 years, consarn it, and now someone might be able to turn on my Tesla from far away. <coughs> um, whoops. Um, so this is, we're in the awkward teenage stage. This happened in aircraft too. The first airplanes weren't very safe. And in fact, people, they found pilots kept crashing uh, <coughs> until the late 1920s. And what was happening is if you fly into a cloud, it feels like you're level and you're really like this, but you could swear you're like this. And they'd get into something called the spiral dive and they'd come out of the clouds and they wouldn't be able to recover and people died like crazy with this. And what they learned was you need an artificial horizon. That's that little ball with the little thing that does that. That is there because people were dying from not knowing which way is down. Okay, it took 30 years for that to happen. I think we're very early in medicine and health. Very early, in fact. So how do you measure security? The best I've seen is this. This is from the Fortune magazine, no, sorry, Forbes magazine article of a couple of years ago. And it is the cost of day zero exploits for various operating systems. Okay, so now we have a market opinion. Now, the problem is this doesn't say just how secure it is. It says how secure is it and how desirable is the target. So we've got two variables. This is not clear, but you could sort of guess what's going on. Clearly, Adobe Re Reader is the least secure piece of software, I don't think anyone here would disagree with that. I think we're all going to say, mm, that's about a zero. Uh, I do my very best not to run Adobe software in anything I have. I think Steve Jobs was right with this. Mac OS X is pretty low. Is that because it's easy to break into? Or is it just that people didn't care so much in 2012? The, it's also interesting to see Chrome is a little safer than uh, Windows and Microsoft Word. These all seem plausible to me. The really interesting one is iOS at the bottom, and I'm going to get back to that. iOS seems was sort of redesigned to be secure, and it's a desirable target, and it has a high price value. Um, there are lots of unresolved issues, and I'm going to have to speed up a bit. I can see that. Uh, client server versus desktop. Programming languages. Programming is hard, as that grumpy Dutchman Edsger Dijkstra said, 
Um, it is hard, and we have a lot of people who don't realize that or who are just aren't very good at it. User interfaces are unsolved. Programming languages, you know, I learned BASIC as my first language, you know, 100, print X, 200, end, that sort of stuff. Oh, those were the days. And then I got to college, and some grumpy professor came and said, this grumpy man, Dijkstra, says that go-tos are dangerous. How could go-tos be dangerous? You need unconditional jumps in programming. No, no, dummy, not you. The, the machine can do them, but you shouldn't do go-tos. And he also said, if, if you've learned basic, you're ruined for life. <laughs> and here I was, good at basic and Fortran, and I had to unlearn a lot of habits, and I learned Pascal. And the thing I found about Pascal was that I could think of how I wanted the program to work, and then I could type it in, and when I got rid of all the typos, the program worked the first time. This was not an experience I had in BASIC and Fortran. And I thought, great. Verth almost has it right. I wrote some system programs in it. It wasn't perfect. Brian Kernhan is right, was right. It wasn't quite perfect. But I said, Nicholas Verth, this guy is great. I can't wait to see what he's doing next. We can all use it, and programming's going to be like that. And I'm still waiting. <laughs> Modula 3 is lovely, but nobody seems to use it. Oberon's an interesting idea. No one seems to use it. This assembly language called C1. And then, oh God, we'll have C++ and Java. So we've got more and more mechanism. But where's the simplicity of Pascal? I think there's still a lot of work we can do towards nice, strong type check languages that are simple that can make programming a lot safer. And of course, I never had a buffer overflow in Pascal. You know, <laughs> you know, if it took the time to check <laughs> and it's, like, oh, no, this won't work. And yes, I did write some dangerous little pieces in assembly that the Pascal would call to do the dangerous stuff. And I was very careful in assembly. So I, it's, I think we can go back on this. I think if I showed the languages that are available now uh, to myself in 1978, I'd be pretty disappointed. I mean, Perl looks like Tico input. And if you know what that means, you have a brain full of crap, uh, <laughs> as do I. <laughs> um, Java, Java was supposed to win, right? It was going to be proven. It had, it had theorem provers in it. It was going to run in a box that it couldn't get out of. And what we didn't realize is that people would not build such a box. You know, it still could be the solution, right? But we don't do that. Native methods, that sort of stuff, lets things go. Why did JavaScript win? I mean, it, OK, you can do it in the web, but now the browser is the operating system of the future, and it's pretty crappy. Cloud computing I talked about. Here's a sign of a wrong track. Virus checkers. A virus checker is like running background checks on the hobos that are living in your living room. <laughs> they shouldn't be there in the first place. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not suggesting you don't run virus checkers. I'm suggesting you run systems that don't need virus checkers. And sort of the Macintosh and certainly the iOS sort of qualify. Um, I'm not saying there are no attacks on these things, but I haven't really seen big viral invasions there. It shows the same thing. StackGuard, wonderful technologies for stack smashing attacks. Why should anyone get anywhere close to stack smashing your stack? That should never happen. We need, we need these for now. Legacy problems. Do you see the legacy problem in this piece of email I got? About the talk, greater than, from. There are some people in this room who know why the greater than was inserted. Can we please get rid of that? We're not running UUCP anymore. <laughs> if you don't know why, I'll tell you afterwards if you're curious. The guy who wrote this did not put the greater than there. The mailer did, so the mailer would continue to work. Um, so we have the tyranny of legacy systems. How are we going to fix all this? Well, we've got trillions invested. Um, Cisco iOS is a legacy system. It has Tony Lee code from the late 80s in it. And I've talked to the guys at Cisco who would love to fix all this and go to new hardware and start over. They can't. Okay. Meanwhile, Cisco is a fine system to attack. Now, there are lots of people who succeeded. That's all we need is the basis of our networks uh, being wide open. And by the way, if you attack and flash RAM and write to it enough times, you can wear it out, and that requires rolling a truck. Uh, more legacy problems. I've seen a bunch, you know, there was EBCDIC and Baudot. Uh, Microsoft Word document formats were a problem. I talked about Cisco. The Macintosh code, they actually rewrote it. What a brilliant thing to do in the late 90s. They went and got Mach and FreeBSD and threw away all their old stuff, and they're much better off for it. It sure was painful. I'm not even sure the company was likely to succeed to survive at the time. 
But those are successes of shedding the legacy. And iOS sh sh shedded legacy. We're still early in the game. Do you use a terminal or a desktop? Plan 9 or mainframe? Who, where do you use the compute power? Here or off in the cloud someplace? Client, server, X terminals, palm top, cloud computing. Which, which one, where do you do this? We're still arguing about this. User interface I talked about. So what works? And you may disagree. Small is better. It's easier to have small bits of software and figure out whether they're okay than big ones. Uh, Norman Wilson, it, when I worked at Bell Labs, every year we'd write a one page, I am great. This is what you did this year. You have one page only and you submit it. And the bosses all looked around and decided who got how much money. Norman Wilson <coughs> wrote um, one year that he removed 2,000 lines of code from the Unix kernel and got big credit points for that. Is anyone removing code from Linux? Are you, remo are you removing a lot of code? I mean, I want to see about 80% of it gone. And we'll talk about what, and, and it's just because there's too much stuff in it. How can you tell what's going on? I believe Linus has said it's gotten too large. It's my understanding. I haven't heard him say that better. Small is better. Plan 9 is a fine operating system for learning how you can do it. Very few system calls, very few calls for the graphics system. Uh, instead of Windows 1300 system calls, Plan 9 had, I don't know, a couple dozen. Um, I like the taste for the approach. If you like the general approach, the same folks that wrote Plan 9 have written Go at Google. So take a look at their, the continuation of their philosophy. Small is better, simpler hardware. Um, you know, we did word processing 30 years ago on a program called WordStar, which I'm not saying was a wonderful user interface, but people could do quick stuff with it and dash off memos. And this was on machines that are not as, didn't have as much memory as the CPU, as the network chip has on our current cards. Um, so maybe we don't need all of this. What else works is extremely careful programmers. It is clear that if you really know your stuff, you can do it. Here's an example. My friend, Vitsa Fenema, another Dutchman, wrote Postfix. It was in beta for a year. A very careful man. He probably knew Dijkstra. I have to ask him. Um, <laughs> at, I'm not saying it has been totally bug-free, and it's an awfully complicated program with all that stuff going on there, but it certainly is held up beautifully. And there are other cases out there um, of stuff. OpenSSL is not one of those cases. And you can go look at the folks who are fixing OpenSSL, the source of the heart bleed problem, and those guys... Are, have long lists of sarcastic bug reports of, well, we're removing the VMS code. Uh, what bothers me is that we as a community didn't notice that we were using such crappy code. I mean, you build open SSL, put it in there. I never heard anyone say, this code is crap. It was written by people who are not Vitsa, and we've got a problem. It was saying that... Yes. Yes, he, he has the bug of that could be dangerous. I'm not going to do it. As Mr. Miyagi said in Karate Kid, best block is no be there. <laughs> so what does winning look like in security? Well, the Rinderpest vaccine. Rinderpest is measles for cows. It's gone. We won that. Analog phone cloning. We don't have to worry about that anymore. It was a big deal in the mid-90s. Hotel keys, this little card is so much better than the pieces of metal we used to have to carry around. Um, automobile keys, it, you now it's hard to steal a car unless you actually hack the computer or lift it up with a forklift. This is winning. And what winning looks like is getting out of the game, or as I said, best block is no be there. Another target is you must be present to win. Uh, if someone's in Latvia, they shouldn't be able to break into my computer. They have to come to my house. And I have nothing against Latvians. Um, it should be no more need for training on clicking on bad things. No more non-IT time with grandma. By the way, I get grief from people about grandma and characterizing grandma. The person I call grandma helped uh, discover elements 100 and 101 with Glenn Seaborg and Oppenheimer. She cross-compiled disk controller code for the Univac 3 on the Univac 1. She's not a slouch. <laughs> she just doesn't need to know about not clicking on attachments. One of the solutions, boy, have I got too many slides left. How many minutes have I got left, Rudy? Uh, I didn't. About 12. 12. Okay. We'll go into fast English mode. Um, 
I think we can build our own CPUs. A good hardware designer, chip designer, graduate student can build a decent CPU chip set, uh, instruction set. You bring in an expert to do out of order execution. They only need to run at what, one gigahertz? You can have no system maintenance mode. I think that chip can be built easily and it's sort of like what you might find inside a Raspberry Pi. And that you could run grandma with that, maybe with an MPEG accelerator so she can watch her movies. Um, a lot of this auto complexity could go away. There are simple operating systems out there. I'm going to be meeting with Andy Tannenbaum yes, tomorrow. Uh, I think Minix 3 is a fine example of what one can do if you think about making this stuff simple and more secure. Uh, personal responsibility for code works. Don Knuth will write you a check if you find a bug in his software. Okay, that's really laying it on the line, isn't it? And uh, DocMaster was the mail server for the National Security Agency put up in the 80s. The people went to the boss and said, we want an external mail server. And he said, if it, the boss said, if it's hacked, you're fired. And to the best of my knowledge, it was never hacked. That's a good motivation. Then there's the idea of literate programming, where you're not writing a program so much as writing a paper, which has pieces of code in it. And you describe all the algorithms and the databases and the algorithms. And when you're done, there are two programs you run on it. One of them makes a tech document and the other builds something you can compile. Okay, so this is documented. That's probably what the pro computer theses, theses, theses should look like. Software annealing. Back in the 80s, SendMail was an awful program. It was huge, it was root, it had holes in it all the time. We're still running SendMail. It still handles a fair percentage of the network mail, of the mail on the internet. Have you heard of a send mail security bug lately? Anyone in the last 10 years? It's still send mail. Eric Allman still, you know, is affiliated with it. It turns out if you take the same software and keep fixing it for long enough, it anneals, it gets safer. And if you don't change it, you can get this. I'm not suggesting that you run send mail. I'm suggesting that once you pick a target and stick to it, you can actually get better. SSH and its protocol has been annealed nicely. Why was OpenSSL changed three years ago? I, I know some of the answer. Why would I want it changed? I want that to anneal into a piece of code that's proven. Strong type checking, I talked about that. VMs, I talked about that. Four digit pins work. I'll talk about that l later today. You know, I, I got it, uh, I'll, talk, I'll do it later. End to end crypto, when in doubt, Encrypt from end to end. I would have hoped by now that with everyone running Pentiums, we'd all be using IPsec. And this was a dream 10, 15 years ago. It hasn't happened. Johnny still can encrypt, but we could. So let's fix that, okay? It's really hard to set up a VPN. Open VPN's okay. But I mean, I want ad hoc crypto between anybody without thinking about it. And I haven't seen anyone come up with an answer to it. It's just too hard and it's not clear to me why. Trusted path is another concept I'm not going to go into now, uh, but it's a concept from the early days that we need. It's actually what Control-Alt-Delete was originally. Formal methods. I have great hope for formal methods. We wanted to use this many decades ago. It was part of the A1 processing in the orange book. Um, formal methods have gotten a lot better, and Moore's Law has made them a lot more powerful. This means proving your program or your specification for your program is right. And they're, they're making good progress on it. They would like to be able to prove simpler programs correct than complicated ones. So it's another reason to get rid of shared libraries. Or for that matter, get rid of memory mapped files. Why do we need all that crap in there? Formal methods, okay, said that. So what would a secure system look like? There's nothing you can click on that swipe or click that will change the software that's running on the machine. Nothing a remote attacker can do to a computer without having physical access. Okay, there you go. Target users for the computer. So building it from scratch. So, you know, well, you know, I'm running out of time here and, and uh, you can read these slides. Trusted hardware, trusted firmware, trusted OS, and a sandbox you can put anything into. That's really the goal we need. If we've got that, grandma's fine and your trips can stop being about viruses. Um, Hardware is a problem. Okay, so who makes the hardware? How do you trust them? Well, maybe we have an open source design for a CPU that labs all, fabs all over the world use. I don't need 12 micron tech, not, sorry, 12 nanometer technology for grandma's CPU. I can use a bigger one, use a little more power. And if it's safe, that's worth a lot. CPUs can be cheap. Software and layers, of course, we talked about that. Sandboxes have to be rock solid. Uh, there's some, 
it's already being done some places, aerospace, aircraft, medical devices, some of them. Many of them in the U.S., you get certified with a particular version of Windows XP, and you're not allowed to upgrade because that would be a different product. Uh, <coughs> um, live CDs. So where might they come from? Is Microsoft going to fix this? Well, you know, they sort of got religion in 2001. And uh, Jeff Jones tells me that Vista and Windows 7 and Windows 8 have fewer security problems than Linux does. I don't know if that's true, but it's plausible. Of course, the problem is everyone's still running XP. It's a huge job. They spend a lot of money. I'd love, I submit they should call it Windows OK, you know, and make it grandma and generals happy. Do we have it already? Maybe. OK. Apple talked about the Macintosh redesign. Maybe iOS. They worked hard to make sure that apps can't do stuff to other apps. Um, app isolation and walled garden were a key security goal. I like those. Um, you know, malware alert, install now. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, we got this. I, I did that one already. I love these devices. I actually learned the language um, to program these because this is such a beautiful device. And it's not a beautiful language, though I enjoy programming in it. It's from the late 80s. Um, I call it Rejective C, as some of you have noticed. Um, but and the, the retain count stuff pretty much went away, which was you were counting references to object stuff. But I don't see how anyone could write a program that they're confident isn't going to crash. I don't have that Pascal assurance. But I said, ah, I'm new to this. I'm sure Apple's programs don't crash wrong. Uh, you, once you get the, the various codes, the X code and so on, and you look at the console, you'll find that Apple stuff is crashing all the time. You know, it goes away and you relaunch the Safari. That was a crash. It's easy recovery, that's, that's nice, but they have the same problem. And they do get jailbroken, though uh, I heard um, one of the conferences I was at two weeks ago was a cybercrime conference where they had a fellow who runs forensics on phone, cell phones. Apparently jailbreaks are getting very, very hard to find on new releases of iOS. That's a good sign. That means Apple is annealing their stuff to become the sort of client I want them to be. Uh, but it's my best bet for secure clients. Um, Android, well, as Tom Lehrer said, the problem with folk songs is they're written by the people, uh, which is a shot at open source here, folks, frankly. How am I doing, Rudy? Five minutes. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, uh, we're converging, aren't we? See, I'm, I'm down to 98. That's good. Um, I, I love Google's attempts at Chrome and Chromium, and, and Go is a nice language. I'd love to see a, a cell phone written in Go. Um, but at the moment, I have little hope for Android. Of course, that's where all the security researchers are poking around because they have access to it. Um, other players, there, there could be lots of companies that are going to do this. An operating system costs about $0 billion to produce, roughly. <laughs> uh, and there are people who have done proven operating systems. I don't have the list here. I probably should. There are also people we've seen who do amazing jobs, like Dean Kamen who did the Segway, but more importantly, did insulin pumps and wheelchairs. It, and by the way, his code is written in C++. Now, if your wheelchair is halfway up a stairway and it drops core, uh, his, his chair handles it. OK? There's somebody doing the right sort of thinking in there to make that happen. I want you to think about how your code would work to do that. Um, Elon Musk. His rockets don't blow up, and so far his cars haven't been hacked that we know of. Uh, but we'll see. There are academic and research groups. Plan 9, Minix. As I said, I'm going to talk to Andrew. What, what may get me off the mountain is uh, trying to see what Minix needs to be better and, and help Andy out with that. Because I'd love to run it in something like a Raspberry Pi. It's just a nice little turnkey, simple operating system that does a few simple things. Peter Neumann and DARPA is doing the crash program. Clean slate. We're going to do everything from hardware on up. They've been thinking or working on this for 30 years. And you know, the military actually releases code that's more secure. Linux SE came from the NSA. OK, and some of us use it. OK, there are a lot of objections to this. And I'm going to skip them because it's my talk. And those people aren't giving the here's why you're wrong, Chez. Um, you know, people make buggy code. The government is going to make us break it. There's still going to be denial of service attacks, and people can still be fooled. I'm not saying the world won't have that, but I think we can win. We have engineered reliable systems out of unreliable parts before. Think about bridges and cars. There's no law of physics that says we can't have bugless programs. Um, we have the home field advantage. 
The correct software can be implemented if we're very careful and selective. Um, I won't live to see all this happen. Uh, this is We're talking decades, folks, I think. I, I'd love to, but I don't think it's going to happen. So there you are. Thank you for your attention. I had a blast. <laughs> We, we have exactly seven minutes for questions. Ah, uh -huh, he's been keeping track. I'm yeah, ready. Bring yeah. them on. <laughs> Please use the mic. Yeah. Show of hands. How many people think I might be right? Whoa. <laughs> Did you think you would have agreed before the talk began? Show of hands. Okay. No. Well, so I don't know. Okay. This is my. <laughs> okay. And any questions? Yeah. They, they want a microphone here. I, the, uh, the, yeah. Yeah. The, the issue that you made about microcode and Intel and AMD, people saying, yeah, you know, there might be a black, black hole in there. Um, Ken Thompson actually said that many years before that oh, yes, in his article trust. on Trusting Trust. Yes, that's right. Um, and in fact, Paul Carger was the one who first came up with that idea. Ken gave the, the talk and implemented it beautifully. Yes, there's, you've got to trust it all the way down. And that might mean that you start by writing your own assembler in octal codes, <laughs> hexadecimal, just to make sure that doesn't happen. Unless someone has done the trusting trust all the way down into the CPU. Uh, you, but, but I think if you are worried about that attack, you can start with this hardware designer who has a pile of, of, of circuits that he builds up, you know, by hand, I guess, and then builds a CPU. You can bootstrap this so that you know you don't have the Thompson attack. I don't think we've ever actually seen a Thompson attack, have we? I, I, I mean, you, you know, you can discover it eventually. The attack is not completely invisible. Um, so, so that's an interesting question. That's too academic. We would never have to worry about that attack. <laughs> <laughs> next next question hello hello uh, yes yep uh, do you think uefi is helping or hindering uefi oh i'm not i i haven't st I, we don't have that on the mountain i haven't looked at it much this is an open source bios or, or no it, it's worse it, it's secure boot secure boot Oh, secure BIOS. The self-proclaimed secure BIOS. I haven't looked at it. Um, maybe I'll sneak a look at lunch and you can ask me this afternoon. I don't know. That's one of the reasons I love coming to these conferences because people, you guys teach me. Um, I will check that out. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you tell me. Do you think it's, do you think it's got a shot? It, it what? Hinders. Well, you know. Now, security doesn't have to hinder. They, we always talk about this trade-off between security and convenience. But this is actually better, right? We can do it. There's no law of physics or nature that says that security has to be a pain in the neck. Sometimes it does. But uh, you can engineer it so it's not necessarily the case. Another question? Hi. My name is Michiel Lenas. I work for NLNet Foundation, and I have your poster, the, the Internet 2001 poster, on yes. my wall for the last decade. So uh, when I look at that, um, can we actually, because you talked about uh, security at the systems level, the Internet is, is, is a very different beast because of its size and because of its unknown uh, entities in there. Can, can we actually secure the Internet? Um, the answer is no, we can't secure the Internet. Uh, but one of the one of the big problems that worries governments and law enforcement is attribution. Where does this attack really come from? And the answer, of course, is if you bother to hide where you're coming from, which, you know, IP laundering attackers have been doing for decades, um, that means grandma's computer is a likely source of the attack. If we can deploy my solution to 70% of the grandmas out there, that makes it harder to find places, people to hide to attack from. And then you get to do something called shunning which is, I'm always getting attacked by China. I don't have anything I need to get on a Chinese web page. I'm going to block their IP addresses. Now, that won't work if China is your, your, your threat model, if they're breaking into grandma from Minnesota and Scotland. But if we're deploying safer machines, I think that becomes a better problem. Remember, I'm talking about decades here. Okay. Uh, one of the cool things that everybody's talking about is Internet of Things. I call it the Internet of Zombies. Yes. But it's about creating, like, 
the tens of millions of stupid devices with no protection on them and just uh, release them on the internet. So the, the amount of stuff that will be will be hiding from or will, where people can hide stuff will actually increase with orders of magnitude in the coming decade. At least that's that, what that's people what are they presenting. Say. Um, I can give you some feedback. Rudy mentioned that my house announces when satellites pass overhead. Uh, my house has been connected to a computer for over 20 years. We're mostly doing sound, but X10 turning lights on and off. If anyone were going to have a toaster or a refrigerator with an IP address, it would be me. And I haven't found any need to do it yet. Nor have I gone online and said, ooh, the new Tesla refrigerator, I have to have that. Um, I'm not sure I'm seeing as much motivation for an Internet of Things as the popular press is talking about. Uh, there are lots of things in my house. I suppose my light switches might have an IP address, but it's going to be a local IPv12 address that you can't reach from the net. You'll have to break into something to break into it. Um, so I, I don't think that's as big a problem as people would hope. The problem is that whatever those things are, are going to be running whatever Linux is lying around and will never get updated. And we've already seen this with uh, routers and so on, that we have eight-year-old software sitting on these things that nobody updates because you're, you're told not to. Do not update this modem unless you're having troubles with it. Uh, you know, if the company's even in, in business. So it is a problem that crappy software would be out there. Another reason I'd love to have some kernel that they'll just put in controllers that actually is reasonably secure. Okay. Oh. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Chess. Yeah. Oh. There's, there's, 